Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in. On behalf of Manila House, this is Bambina Olivares, Director of Programming, welcoming members and non-members alike to today's online conversation with Dr. Rona Bergantin, Infectious Diseases Specialist at the University of Santo Tomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery uh, Beyond Omicron, Living with COVID-19. If this is your first time to join us online, allow me to introduce Manila House. We are a private members club that opened in February 2017 with the aim of bringing together an assemblage of people from the business, creative, cultural, and intellectual communities who are drawn to each other by a shared interest to continuously learn about art, culture, food, business, and politics, and from the diversity of their fellow members themselves. And it is a com com community of committed, curious, and caring individuals that lives on beyond the physical confines of the club. We began our webinar series in May 2020, covering and encouraging discussion about a range of topical issues from business and investment to health and wellness and arts and culture. We have featured both local and international speakers and continue to broaden our reach among members and non-members alike. Our previous webinars are available for viewing on the Manila House YouTube channel. That said, for the non-members among us, you might like to consider membership to Manila House. We have a limited number of memberships still available. Please email membership at manilahouseinc.com for more information. Please be informed that Manila House, in compliance with the allowable IATF and LGU capacities, is open for dine-in to fully vaccinated members and guests, and our takeaway service is open to the public. Please call us on 0917-816-3685 to place your orders. We also have your Manila House favorites now available in the frozen, ready-to-heat version. So let's begin. And before we start, just a few ground rules. This event is being recorded and live streamed, and it will be up on the Manila House YouTube channel in a day or two. Please use the chat box in the Q&A and A box for any questions and comments, and we'll get to your questions as we go along. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Rona Bergantian. Um, just give me a second here. So Dr. Rona Bergantin is an infectious diseases specialist with the Faculty of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Santo Tomas. She obtained her medical degree at the University of Santo Tomas and um, finished her residency and fellowship in internal medicine and adult infectious diseases at the same university's hospital. She further pursued a postgraduate degree in virology at the Liverpool John Morris University in the United Kingdom. She's currently an associate professor at the USD Faculty of Medicine and Surgery and is a clinician at the USD Hospital where she's also the training officer for the Adult Infectious Diseases Fellowship Training Program. So I'm sure you'd like to hear um, all about, um, as we know, COVID is here to stay with us. At least that's what the experts, um, public health experts seem to say. And um, so what next um, for all of us? So um, Dr. Rona has prepared a really engrossing um, uh, lecture um, for us today, and um, she'll, it's very, it's quite detailed and quite thorough, um, and it gives you a really good overview of the situation up to now, and with um, suggestions and recommendations on how to deal with this, um, with this um, disease that is now endemic in the population, and um, how to move forward with this reality. Dr. Rona. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Bambina, and thank you, Manila House, for um, inviting me for this, um, for this webinar. So um, this is the, I think, now familiar picture of the COVID-19 virus with its spike protein, its spherical appearance. And this uh, came out 2020 from the CDC. So we're going to the timeline, going over to what happened over the past two years. So we have to understand and then recall that it was in December 2019 when a cluster of patients in Wuhan, China, initially had shortness of breath. And eventually, within that same month, the WHO country office in China informed that there were cases of pneumonia of unknown cause. I think during that time, they 
only um, call it as NCOV because um, the virus still has no specific name to it. And the cases they have connected somehow to, uh, to the Huan and Seafood Wholesale Market in Wuhan. And then eventually, a month later, they were able to isolate a novel coronavirus. And uh, a week later, after the isolation, of the virus, the first report of the lab confirmed case in Thailand came into being. So in the Philippines, we had the first reported case uh, last January 30, 2020. So it uh, happened to a foreign traveler during the time, I think it was in Cebu. But um, eventually, there were no reported transmission yet locally during the time. So there came almost a month of quiescence with regards to this COVID-19 in uh, February 2020. But during the time, the WHO has already announced that instead of the NCO, they are calling the disease COVID-19 officially and the virus that is associated with it is our SARS-CoV-2, which is closely related to the previous uh, SARS-CoV virus, which we had way back in 2003, I believe. Now, same month in 2020, uh, Italy became a hotspot for COVID-19 infection. And then later on, on the 5th of March, the first local case was identified in our country. And uh, six days later, again, the WHO has now recognized that COVID-19 has um, affected lots of countries. Therefore, it was declared a pandemic. So... Um, a few days later, Manila and some other neighboring um, provinces, I believe, has been put on the enhanced community quarantine. And during that same month, while the world is quite busy attending to the pandemic, the first human COVID-19 vaccine trial um, sponsored by Moderna has been uh, undergoing through uh, in the United States. And um, the WHO also started what we call as the solidarity trial, where in some um, repurposed drugs have been used to address the, the infection. So basically, as these things are going through, so in the Philippines, it became mandatory for the public to wear masks in public areas. And of course, um, also in that same month, in April 2020, uh, the, Gen Amplif the Gen Amplify COVID-19 kit, which has been locally manufactured um, under, um, the, under Dr. Raul Desura, has been distributed uh, in the country. And so during the time when there has been limited number of testing kits for COVID-19, at least we're now able to utilize the locally manufactured kit. Because I remember or recall that during the early days of the pandemic, the tests or the samples that we have have to be sent to RITM and then eventually RITM, I think, has still to send the samples to Australia. So at least during the latter part of April, rather, there has already been increasing number of um. Uh, at least almost two months uh, into May 2020, there has been uh, easing of the ECQ to MECQ or GCQ in certain areas of Luzon, but not yet, I believe, in Manila. And during this time, one of the variants has been already discovered in South Africa, and this is the beta variant. So we have to also remember again that you have an original variant, and then by some mutations in the protein, there will now be variants, or there were now variants that have been discovered. So in June 2020, uh, I think um, the global, the World Bank has stated that the COVID-19 will plunge the global economy into the worst recession since uh, World War II. I'm not an economist, but I think we have seen the effects of um, COVID-19 in our in our uh, economy. Not now. In September 2020, and also a month later, two other variants of COVID have been discovered, the Alpha variant and the dreaded Delta variant, which has affected um majority of the world um, at almost a year later. So in November 2020, when Brazil was already showing um, the increasing number of mortality that they have in the country, that was because of the Gamma variant. Now, during the during that same year, 
So the latter part, this was already in December. The very first person who has received the vaccine in the United Kingdom has been has 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 received um the Pfizer vaccine. So this is outside the clinical trial. And during that same same month, surprisingly, uh, that very same vaccine received um, emergency use validation. Now, in our country, still while the rest of the world has already been having a vaccination program, it took quite a while for the vaccines to arrive in the Philippines. So um, the, the vaccines arrived, Sinovac arrived in two, uh, February 28th on February rather 28, 2021. And then the first um, first time that the vaccine has been administered uh, to the Filipinos was on March 1, 2021. Now, uh, a few days later, we also received COVAX donated AstraZeneca vaccine. So COVAX is a facility that has been um, established by the WHO and um, it serves to distribute vaccines to but I believe lower, uh, lower, uh, so middle income to lower uh, income countries. Now, between April to November 2021, we have seen surges of COVID-19 with either alpha, beta, and even the Delta variants. And somehow in November 2021, the Omicron has already been detected in multiple countries, although, although they have mentioned that these started in, in South Africa. Um, during April to November 2020, if I will be allowed to share, I have to say that these were the times when we have to go on double duties because there really has been a lot number, a large number of individuals who have been admitted in the hospital. Um, of course, there is a large number of individuals seeking treatment, but the health capacity or the the capacity of the hospitals are beyond or the hospitals are beyond their capacity. So some of the individuals really have to be treated at home. Now, after the discovery of the COVID uh, Omicron variant in 2021, of November 2021, here in the Philippines, at least two months later, uh, we had the Omicron variant surge. But at least somehow the Omicron variant surge is not as bad as what we had experienced somewhere between April to November 2021, simply because uh, we have a lesser number of individuals who got um, really critically ill or um, crit uh, severe, severely ill. Because I remember during the time of the surge of the beta as well as the delta strain, um, the critical care unit of almost all hospitals in the country uh, are really into uh, full capacity. Somehow we have been able to manage these uh, Omicron variant. Majority of the patients uh, stayed at home or and for those who have been admitted in the hospital, they did not have much um, did not have much uh, critical condition. And I believe, majority of the infectious diseases and probably even the health community will agree with me when we say that this may have been contributed and attributed to the presence of the COVID-19 vaccines. Now, come this month, the question that we have is, is the worst over? Because we've already seen the uh, Omicron variant surge and we very well know that the numbers are decreasing. Although in other countries, there are already still um, spikes. So the question is, what's next? Are we ready to be to move forward? So before we move forward, we have to we have to understand and look back what we have learned so far over the last two years. Now we have learned that the transmission, of course, occurs um, through respiratory droplets. So coming from the animals initially, where they have attributed this to be a zoonotic um, illness, coming from pangolins or even um, bats. Uh, the transmission, human-to-human -human transmission is via respiratory droplets. And when we have contact with respiratory secretions in saliva, as well as uh, aerosol particles whenever we do aerosol generating procedures. So these aerosol particles are a lot smaller than the droplets that we often uh, have when we speak. And basically, there's also been... Um, uh, how do you call this? Documented that... The fecal oral route has been a mode of transmission. Okay, so um, earlier on, 
it has been it has been seen that COVID nineteen has 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 been or can be isolated coming from the feces as well. Aside from the fact that COVID-19 transmission is already established, we have to understand that contrary to the belief in the early days of the pandemic that only adults are infected with a virus, we have to agree again, and this has already been documented, that COVID-19 can affect individuals of all ages. So for the adults, the median age of hospitalized patient is somewhere between 45 to 73 years, typically with male preponderance, and in children, okay, so kids can also be infected, and we have seen that during the Omicron surge. That's uh, very that's very uh, blatantly seen in in a healthcare setting. Um, like the adult counterparts, boys are more infected than girls, but the kids are less likely to be. Um, to, to present with uh, severe disease. So they're more likely to be asymptomatic. So the disease manifestations in the kids are a lot, uh, a lot uh, better than what we have in adults. And typically the recovery is seen within one to two weeks after the onset of symptoms. Now we also have seen that COVID have, has mutations. So we have three different categories of these mutations for quote unquote variants of interest. So whenever uh, an emerging variant is discovered, so this is said to be a variant of interest. And uh, coming from the CDC or from the scientific community, this variant of interest are said to be COVID mutations, which are associated with changes in the receptor binding. And of course, they have documented some reduction in the effect of antibodies, which have been generated uh, either um, against previous infection or vaccination in such a way that we do get to have reinfection with COVID. Now, there is also this possibility of reduction in the efficacy of treatment with potential diagnostic impact or probably even a predicted increase in transmissibility or even disease severity. So these are variants of interest. But eventually, when these variants of interest showed real evidence of increasing transmissibility, there are more severe deaths, um, ergo there is increased hospitalization, um, or death, then these are now labeled variants of concern. And this is what we have seen with alpha, beta, the gamma, delta variants. And later on, of course, Omicron, although as I have mentioned earlier on, Omicron, severi the severity of the disease in Omicron is not as bad as the previous variants, probably again with the presence of the vaccine. Now, with regards to the variants of concerns, there is significant reduction in the the effectivity of the antibodies. So whether, again, this patient had prior infection or has been vaccinated, um, individuals are still at risk to have a reinfection. So earlier on in the days of the pandemic, we're not quite sure if, um, if COVID really will have a protective, um, protective um, levels to individuals, let's say I have had an infection now, will I not be, will I not have an, an additional or a new infection? But we have seen patients who get admitted and only to be readmitted again or only to be isolated again simply because they have uh, another uh, manifestation of illness. And during the time earlier on in the pandemic, um, repeat RT-PCR has been advocated as what we are following what China did earlier on. But then eventually that policy for repeating RT-PCR was thankfully abolished. So for the variants of concern, we have seen that there has been some reduction in the effectivity of treatments or vaccine. Although based on the studies, the, the code and code reduction in the effectivity of the vaccine or treatment are not clinically significant. So it means that even if there may be documented a reduction of, active, of effectivity in the trials, this does not translate to what we see in the, in the public or in the real world setting. Um, one of the concerns that they had earlier on with the discovery of these variants is the failure to detect um, viruses simply because there might be some changes in the protein, which will now um, make the existing diagnostics be unable to detect the presence of a virus. 
Now, one of the things which hasn't happened yet and we're hoping not to happen is that the CDC has placed um, another category of these viral mutations as what we call as variant of high consequence. Simply because when we talk of variants of high consequence, there is clear evidence that the measures are of medical or medical countermeasures have, of course, largely reduced effectivity. And this will mean that there will be failure of diagnostic targets. So we're not going to be able to diagnose the presence of circulating strains. We're just probably going to see patients who become ill or uh, going or be brought to the hospital without us being able to identify what kind of virus hit this, this person. Now, for the mutations with the variants of high consequence, there will be more severe diseases and rather increased hospitalizations and possibility of increased risk of death. Likewise, the effectivity of the existing vaccines or even the protective um, the protective um, means that our previous infections have uh, rendered to a previously infected individual will definitely not exist. And even if we have some vaccines, we very well know that there may be breakthrough infection, but not high. In this, if we're going to be dealing with a COVID-19 virus with the quote-unquote variant of high consequence, there will be a disproportionately high breakthrough disease. So meaning even if, there, if the majority of the population has already been vaccinated, there might be a time when uh, even this individuals who have um, been vaccinated will have a high number who will have a risk of acquiring infection. So this is our team, some of our residents uh, during our COVID war duty. Now, what are again have what what again have we learned so far? So these are the common symptoms, and I think they have not changed over time. So fever, we have cough, dry cough often seen. Some patients with manifest with sore throat, runny or stuffy nose. So when we say anosmia, a person cannot smell. Okay, this gyusha or agyusha, when we say this gyusha, there is a sense of off taste. So probably something uh, salt will taste uh, salty or something sweet will taste bitter. And this happens in some of our patients or what we term as agyusha, it's a complete absence of taste. Uh, the shortness of breath, which is also often seen more, especially in those patients who have severe to critical illnesses. Some patients would only manifest with muscles or body aches uh, similar to what we have when we have flu or some other non-specific infection. Headaches, okay. Of course, when we say headaches, headaches can also be seen not only in infectious diseases. Now, there are certain individuals who would tell us that uh, they are quite tired often. So fatigue is also a common symptom of the coronavirus. Vomiting is also manifested or diarrhea, as I have mentioned earlier on, the virus can be isolated uh, from the feces. Now we have to understand that not all the symptoms can, should manifest or should be seen in individuals. So there are uh, hodgepodge of these uh, symptoms seen in, in individuals. And of course, um, you have to have a high index of suspicion who among these individuals may likely be um, infected. And at times we get accused of being, quote unquote, overacting, uh, being more on the, how do you call this, on the um, active side or being, being, let's say, OA simply because we suspect anyone who would manifest this with these symptoms as having COVID. But again, why is this so? Remember that this illness, even if it infects only one individual in the household, can potentially infect three, four, or even five uh, individuals in that same household. So the magnitude of illness is what makes this a public health concern. And Learning from what we have in the past, even if we compare this to our regular flu, I can say, and I can personally uh, say this, and probably even the infectious diseases who, uh, who sees patients with me will agree that 
this kind of virus is a lot more dangerous compared to the usual coronavirus because the receptors to which the the virus attaches to the cells does not only affect the lining of the respiratory tract it also affects the lining of the gastrointestinal tracts even the kidneys because uh, the receptors are dotted in that line and of course the walls of the blood vessels have these kinds of receptors. So that's why even if we have patients who improve in, in the end, there may be some patients whom we are able to send uh, back home, um, seemingly doing okay, they will end up having quote-unquote stroke or what we term a cerebrovascular accident or would have a um, case of a heart attack simply because there is still or there may be ongoing inflammation in the blood vessels. Okay, so this is just a breaker slide. This is how our uh, university looks like early in the morning after the rain. Now, again, in, the, in terms of diagnostics, in the, uh, over the past two years, we have seen and we are still utilizing this, the nasopharyngeal swab, the oropharyngeal swab. And after collection, we place them in the viral transport medium to be brought to the laboratory to be subjected to PCR in such a way that tests like this will, will come out. So I have to share a secret. This result is my own, uh, my own result. So I had COVID-19 way back in January 2021 when vaccines were not yet available. And thankfully, during that time, uh, my manifestation is not bad. Uh, I lost taste, though, as well as lost sense of smell. But honestly, I did not have any cough. I did not have any cold. It's just that I had nosebleed. And during the time, we were suspecting that I had dengue, which, of course, I did not have, only to find out that I had COVID. So I had to undergo the recommended isolation period during the time. And before... I was reintegrated into the community. I have to seek clearance coming from the local government unit. And me being a house, uh, being a frontliner, uh, our household had to be uh, placed on complete uh, quarantine. So the other members of my family have been quarantined. And thankfully, none of them um, got the illness. Uh, so during that time, uh, it was only I who had been infected. Now, aside from the RT-PCR result, the COVID-19 antigen test has already been in existence. And I think this has helped a lot, most especially during the Omicron surge, because majority of the patients um, who have been infected during this surge um, had to stay home, but they have to be, but rather than going to the hospital or healthcare institutions or laboratories to have their PCR done, most of them had themselves undergo um, antigen tests. And it's quite good that the uh, FDA, Philippine FDA, had lots of approved um, quality antigen testing kit. So after a patient would test positive, then definitely that patient needs to be isolated. So it really helped a lot because uh, during the early days of the surge of uh, the Omicron, um, instead of a rapid turnaround time of four hours for the PCR, there has been delays in the release of the results simply because of the bulk of the, of the test that needs to be done. Now, it's more important for us to understand that during the past two years, we have to see, we have seen that even in the presence or absence of symptoms, so there, if there will be a significant exposure to an individual who has had COVID and there will be test results that will be positive, then we can already give a COVID-19 diagnosis. So when this happens, what do we usually do? So um, whenever we have or we have we are faced with an individual who has COVID-19 diagnosis, often we tell them to isolate. But then I think uh, when we talk of isolation and quarantine, what happens is that they are always uh, interchanged uh, or inter interchangeably used. But we have to clarify when we talk of isolation. These are individuals who have been infected with the virus. So they are the sick people with the disease and they are separated from individuals who are not sick. So if I have the virus, whether I have symptoms or no symptoms at all, or what we call as asymptomatic, I have to be isolated in such a way that I will not be able to infect others. Now, 
when we say quarantine, on the other hand, we separate these individuals who have been exposed but do not have evidence of infection in such a way that uh, they can be observed and uh, it can be seen if they're going to become sick. And at the same time, uh, when a, an individual who has been exposed is placed on quarantine, this also serves to reduce the risk of transmitting a possible infection to others simply because we very well know that over the last two years, the incubation period of COVID-19 is around 14 days. And anything can happen during those 14 days from the time of exposure until that quote-unquote 14-day um, observation has, has, been, has been completed. Now, before we go through the latest or the update with regards to the isolation or quarantine protocols that have been set by the by the DOH uh, early in January and early or er, earlier on in February this year, we have to have a clear definition of what fully vaccinated means. And those individuals are only partially vaccinated. So when we say fully vaccinated, it means that uh, individuals who have received two doses of two dose vaccines or individuals who would have a single dose vaccine that is in the form of Janssen because that's the only vaccine that we have that is given a single dose. So individuals who received these doses of vaccines for more than two weeks are now said to be fully vaccinated. And if you're going to ask me why is it that it needs to have two weeks for these individuals to be um, categorized as fully vaccinated, it's simply because the antibody formation in an individual would take around two weeks. So if at least two weeks has elapsed, then somehow we have this um, this uh, this uh, setting that individuals have already been fully vaccinated and their antibodies are already working in such a way that if they are going to encounter the natural virus, then these antibodies can already be, can work against that natural infection. Earlier on, when we give lectures with regards to the effect of vaccine, we do not claim that the vaccines are 100% effective. But what happens is that in the presence of the existing or pre-existing antibodies developed when an individual receives a vaccine, the manifestations of the illness in individuals are blunted or muted. Therefore, only mild illness is seen. So rather than being hospitalized, having been critically ill, so these individuals can probably just stay at home and then recover. And the manifestations that they may have probably even will be, there will be even a shorter duration of illness. Now, when we say that an individual is only partially vaccinated, so for those individuals who only received a single dose of a two-dose vaccine, they are considered partially vaccinated. And this is very important now because we have newer guidelines which uh, tells us what to do uh, when we have patients who would have uh, partially or fully vaccinated or even unvaccinated. So again, when we say quarantine, this refers only to individuals who are not ill, who are not infected with a virus, but who have been in close contact with individuals who have the illness. So when we say quarantine of asymptomatic close contact, the recommendation of the DOH is that they can be uh, quarantined five days from the last day of exposure, or for those who are unvaccinated or only partially vaccinated, 14 days from the last day of exposure. Take note, though, that this individual should not develop any symptoms during this time, during the time when they are uh, when they are um, quarantined. If symptoms now with develop, then these individuals need to be isolated and then accounting of the number of days for that isolation will start from the day of the onset of that symptoms. So individuals who would have uh, sim uh, who would be uh, symptomatic suspect probable when we say individuals who would have exposure but do not have any evidence of a positive test or confirmed mild cases from previous 14 days in the past, these fully vaccinated individuals now are only recommended to have uh, isolation of seven days. Again, granted that during the last three days of the isolation, 
these individuals will not have or should not be manifesting with any symptoms. And among this, the symptoms that uh, should not be present will, of course, be cough and fever. Now, for those individuals who have been unvaccinated or partially vaccinated, at least 10 days of isolation from the symptoms onset is recommended. So you're going to ask me, Doc, how about if the patient's um, cough uh, presents or continues to manifest beyond that seven days or probably even beyond that 10 days? Then you have to continue isolating that individual. Basically, in the literature, they say that the shedding of the virus uh, uh, has, is at its peak between five to six days, and then eventually it declines by 10th day of illness. But then, of course, you can never be too sure if someone you are facing with or uh, coming close contact with is coughing at you, and you will not be happy if you're going to see these individuals. So again, when we say isolation, we have to ensure that these individuals are not manifesting with any symptoms before this isolation is lifted. Now, how about those individuals with moderate cases? So when we say moderate cases, these are individuals who would have pneumonia. And those individuals who would have underlying comorbidities who would have a manifestation. So either individuals who are requiring to have oxygen but not that low yet compared to the categorization of oxygen needed when an individual is severely or critically ill. And those individuals who would have pneumonia but would have coexisting comorbidities such as hypertension or diabetes or underlying chronic kidney condition. Now, regardless of the vaccination status, whether these individuals are fully vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or unvaccinated, the newest recommendation is that this individual should isolate at least 10 days from the symptom onset. And these isolation can be lifted, again, if these individuals will have a symptomatic period three days from the lifting of that, of that recommended um, isolation. Now, for those who are critically ill and severely ill, so when we say uh, severely ill, this individuals who stay in the hospital who would have high flow oxygen, but then they have a specific uh, ratio of oxygen, uh, which needs to be needs, needs to be evaluated for them to be categorized as critical. So, regardless again of the vaccination status, they are to be isolated for at least twenty one days from the onset of symptom. However, I have here asterisk for the immunocompromised individuals, so those who are receiving high-dose steroids, those patients undergoing chemotherapy, those patients who are under who are also receiving immunosuppressive agents either related to their autoimmune disease or probably even related to their transplantation, then it's recommended that a negative RT-PCR be documented. Note that nowadays, um, as I'm going to show you later on, a repeat RT-PCR is not recommended for the isolation to be lifted. But then for these immunocompromised conditions, who uh, for these immunocompromised individuals who may not be able to put up adequate immune response simply because they don't have adequate antibodies or the other cells in their body, the white cells in their body are not fully functioning, they have to have a documented uh, improvement or absence of the of the virus in their system. Now, again, with a recommendation that we have for only mild to moderate 19 treatment for a COVID-19 uh, treatment for those non-hospitalized or who opt to stay home, they, you can give them a paracetamol or as antipyretics, of course, increase oral fluids for those individuals who can tolerate and who are at not risk or, or who are at low risk for uh, becoming uh, congested. So, uh, they have to stay home whether or they have to be isolated, whether in quarantine facilities or should I say isolation facilities? Because uh, as I have mentioned, isolation pertains to those individuals who are ill and quarantine pertains to those individuals who are not ill but have been exposed. And of the recent, the additional thing that we have will be the use of the monoclonal antibodies, but these are not widely available, available only in selected um, institution in Metro Manila and probably uh, some in, in Davao or in Cebu. And of course, the oral formulation of COVID-19 drug, which is molnupiravir. So this has been uh, given uh, as prescribed uh, uh, by by 
um, healthcare experts, whenever they encounter patients who would have COVID-19 who would manifest with mild to moderate symptoms. Take note that when we talk of COVID-19, there is no need to give the empiric antibiotics because antibacterials that we have will definitely not work against a virus. And of course, even the anti-influenza drugs are not recommended because simply the influenza drugs will work against influenza, but not with COVID-19. Unfortunately, not all hospitals in, in the Philippines will have the multiplex PCR, which can detect um, COVID-19 alongside with some other probable respiratory viruses because some respiratory viruses would manifest similarly with the COVID-19 virus illness. Now, this is just an example or a screenshot of uh, how, how our home quarantine instructions would look like. So individuals um, whom we see who can be managed at home are given this uh, home quarantine instructions. And it's important that we tell them that you are not allowed to mingle with other individuals, even in your household, until so-and-so days. And you have to monitor your body temperature at least three times daily and record this. Aside from body temperature monitoring, if there will be available blood pressure monitoring system, then that will be a lot better. Or even probably what we call a pulse oximeter or, or oximetry so that the oxygen level of these individuals can be monitored. Anytime that the oxygen really deeps, okay, and it's maintained at low levels, or individuals would have a worsening of condition, then they are instructed again to go to the hospital and have themselves admitted. Now, for the, those who are moderately ill, so meaning those individuals who really have pneumonia and cannot be managed at home, or those who really have low levels of oxygen for that matter, need to be managed in the hospital. And coming from the various trials that we have over the years, we now have um, some of the some of the um, agents which uh, we now use as part of the standards of care for these COVID-19 patients. Again, upon patient discharge and even after isolation has been completed, no need for a repeat RT-PCR. Not even a repeat antigen is recommended. Now, we move through the fact that we know that there is an existing COVID-19 vaccine. Not just one, but there are lots of vaccines. Now, before I go through these vaccines, uh, we have to show that when we talk of vaccines, we have two major types, the whole virus vaccine and then vaccines which are only um, which will work, but it's not the whole virus vaccine, which it's not which is it's not the whole virus which is available, but only part uh, of that virus. So probably a protein or probably an RNA or a DNA, which is, of course, again, still part of the protein that we have. But when we talk of whole virus vaccines, we have this inactivated kind, which um, contains a real copy of the virus, only the virus is already killed and rendered, um, rendered very, very, very inactive. So it will not cause, it will not multiply, and it will not, uh, uh, it will not, um, really be the source of infection to an individual when the patient is vaccinated, where an individual is vaccinated. Take note that at present, even if in some other vaccines in the past, we have live attenuated uh, component, we don't have uh, live attenuated viruses for COVID-19. But we do have some protein subunits. We have DNA-based, even RNA-based vaccines, or even non-replicating viral vector vaccines. And as of yesterday, uh, there are already 33 approved vaccines, okay, with 197 countries covered with this approved vaccine. But only 10 of them had EUL um, WHO. Uh, or when uh, are included in the emergency use listing of the WHO vaccine. Take note that there are 183 vaccine candidates and there are various trials uh, going on in a lot of different countries around the globe. So among these 33 approved uh, vaccines globally, there are 10 which are categorized as inactivated. 
So example of these will be the Sinovac that we have, and then the protein subunit vaccines, the non-replicating viral vaccines, the RNA vaccines, which uh, two of which are quite commonly uh, being um, mentioned, Pfizer and of course Moderna, and one DNA vaccine. So in our country, we have 11 approved vaccine. So two RNA, four non-replicating viral vector vaccine, which will include, of course, the AstraZeneca and uh, inactivated vaccine, our uh, uh, how would they call this? Um, Sinovac and one protein subunit vaccine. Now, these vaccines, as I have mentioned, really do work. Uh, aside from, um, from muting or blunting the manifestations of illness, they have been shown to reduce uh, transmissibility of infection by 71%. Um, we have learned again that over this past two years, majority of the transmission um, of the virus can happen, whether in coming from asymptomatic individuals, for those individuals who are um, mildly ill, moderately ill, or probably even severely ill, because they often um, correlate the severity of the illness with the load of the virus. But then again, in the presence of the vaccine, there has been a reduction in the risk of transmission by 71%. Again, these are my fellows who have graduated last year. Uh, I'm quite proud that all of them are already board-certified infectious diseases specialists. Okay. So we have additional measures. Okay, so this is nothing new. These measures have been in existence from the start of the pandemic. So we have been always uh, prompted about observing physical distancing. So observing either um, three feet or six feet if the if the space will allow um, distance from one another. We are we are promoting adequate ventilation, adequate uh, exchange of air so that the virus can be swept away from uh, from the area because we very well know that in enclosed spaces the chances of a person inhaling that virus is very high. And of course, again, we have to wear masks, whether in public or in even in in private or uh, enclosed spaces, most especially in the setting of the healthcare setting. Now, these are the things that we can do personally. Mask wearing as well as hand hygiene and surface cleaning because earlier on in the pandemic, there has been guidelines which have been published and printed how to clean the office space or uh, how to clean spaces in the house using our standard bleach solution uh, diluted with water. And then there are also some disinfectants which have come out in the market, which can be used to clean the surfaces or the high touch uh, surfaces in our in our environment. So whether we are working from home or really working uh, in the office, uh, we are told to do this. Now, of the things that need to be, um, that I think need to be improved, and I think we have uh, remarkably jumped a lot on this, is the fast and sensitive testing and tracing. Because in the early days of the pandemic, only those individuals who are symptomatic and who are badly ill are the ones who get to have themselves um, undergo RT-PCR, simply because RT-PCR is not widely available during the start of the pandemic. But I think the DOH has already approved a very large number of laboratories, whether hospital-based or freestanding laboratories, which can cater to individuals who would have symptoms pertaining to a possibility of um, COVID-19. That's why there is enhanced testing. And of course, quarantine and isolation needs to be present. Now, years, uh, several months ago, my mom asked me, uh, why you said that we really cannot contain uh, the virus? And this is just my personal opinion, although I have voiced this out in uh, conversation with some of my colleagues. Um, contrary to the popular belief when I was growing up that the prime expert of the Philippines is uh, agricultural products. This time, the source of our incomes come from our overseas Filipino workers who happen to want to go home to spend the holidays with us. And we can't blame them because home will always be home. Philippines will always be home. Unfortunately, our quarantine um, quarantine policies probably need to be improved a lot because 
I think uh, the virus travels with them, even if they do test negative from the countries where they came from, when they mingle, and then eventually uh, they get to meet people, then they bring along and spread along, not just the love, but the virus with them. And we have seen that. Year 2021, after, after the holidays, even if there has been a ban in doing uh, or uh, mixing or let's say meeting of individuals, we do get to have an increase in the number of beta variant during the time. And then um, come January 2020, we have seen a surge in the Omicron variant. These are not variants which really came from our country, but this has been coming from other countries and they cannot have just landed in the in our soil without them being transported and coming along with an individual who came from an area where they are already circulating. So I think we have to beef up on the quarantine and isolation facilities. And of course, lastly, we have the support coming from our government and more importantly, we have these vaccines. Take note that the Swiss cheese respiratory virus pandemic defense uh, has been utilized simply because we very well know that the Swiss cheese has lots of holes. And through these holes, the virus can pass through. But these intervention or layers, even if they have imperfections or holes, if we use multiple layers, uh, this improves our success. And therefore, there is now a decline in the number of COVID-19 in our setting. Now, the question is, are we there yet? Are we seeing that the worst is over? Honestly, it's too soon to tell. But, but, coming from what uh, Eleanor Roosevelt has quoted before, you gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop to look fear in the face. And I think we've done that. You're able to say to yourself, I have lived through this horror. I can take the next thing that comes along. And you must do the thing you think you cannot do. So we have to move forward. But modifying what Eleanor Roosevelt has mentioned before, we have to do this. We have to do the thing we think you, we cannot do with caution. Now, similar to most of you who would want to go on, move on with what we need to do, our family is looking forward once again to, to have a journey. So as we go through our day-to-day -day journey, so our Camino, whether the, load, the, the road is quite long, the destination is quite far, even if we encounter dark days, we have to see the, the, the silver lining in that dark clouds. Or if there will be days of peace and quiet or serenity, we have to always focus on the end of our journey. So we have to move forward. We cannot be cowed by a snippet of uh, protein. We have to move forward and we can do this together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rona. That was really comprehensive. Um, I wanted to ask, though, um, whether you say like we have to live with it anyway, but are there do we still have to do the mitigating measures and, and to what degree, though, because what is the likelihood of another variant um, coming out? And we don't have no idea how mild or how severe that variant. That's would be. true. That's true. Well, we have been told that variants come out every two weeks or mutations come out every two weeks. And when we say mutation, it doesn't only mean that this mutation can lead to um, a worse kind of variant, but then there are certain instances wherein mutations can lead to, uh, to rather blunting of the effectivity of the virus. So we're just going to pray that there might be, that um, the COVID might, we might encounter variants which really not be uh, bad. So how do we move? Of course, we have to continue with what we have. So of course, that proper distancing, face mask, hand washing, hand hygiene is really very important. So we do things with caution. So right now, we are moving back to face-to-face -to -face classes, and we are gearing to doing that. So I believe next week, uh, some of our medical students will be going back to, um, to the classroom. 
and we're looking forward to that really because we have already been we have already seen them vaccinated so most of us now already know what we can do how we are going to protect ourselves unlike before we're so quite naive naive of the nature of the virus naive of the things that we need to do so right now we i think we have some somehow learned a lot but definitely we have to be humble enough to acknowledge that we don't know yet a lot about these things. So we still rely on the recommendations of the expert. And the knowledge that we have about COVID-19 is ever dynamic. So it's always evolving. So from time to time, we may get confused. Why is it that the recommendation a week ago is a lot different from the recommendation that we have right now? So we don't we don't need to be mad for uh, at the at this um experts doing this recommendation because of course we vary the recommendation based on the uh on the current situation okay. simply because this is to protect individuals but what about children though because um there are reports that a lot of the transmission now is coming from children passing it on to their parents or you know who who have so far you know been able to avoid catching covid and and then all of a sudden the child gets it and uh, i think we're not allowing vaccinations under am i right under under 5 under, under five, 5 not yet yeah so we're just hoping that the vaccination to younger kids will be done um i i i think the government has somehow beefed up with their uh vaccine vaccination uh program but studies abroad are the ones which we rely on so if this existing uh vaccines will really show that there is big efficacy in protecting our kids then definitely they will be uh, they will also be applied to the children younger than five years old of course there will always be that problem of vaccine hesitancy that has always been, that we have always encountered that a lot um Basically, I am one of those individuals who were quite hesitant to receive vaccines about, yeah, initially in the uh, in the earlier days of the pandemic because, hey, I don't know the nature of the vaccine that is being manufactured. But then earlier on in this century, or rather the past century, um, aside from vaccine and clean water, these are the things which really um, stop the transmission of um of uh, infectious diseases. So mm -hmm. the technology with regards to the vaccination is already in place, only they apply a different kind of um, pathogen. So let's say with regards to the messenger RNA virus vaccine that we have, so the Pfizer and even Moderna, initially um, individuals are hesitant about receiving these vaccines. Um, the platform for the or the studies for these vaccines have been conducted earlier on, even in the at the onset of um, HIV and then Ebola way back uh, years ago. But then they have only included this, or probably I cannot I can I cannot say perfected it, but then he improved a lot from where they um, coming from the crude things that they did earlier on, so that it can be applied to individuals and. This is how we see things. Um, probably we have to learn what we had coming from the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. Now, during that time, uh, things have been bad. But then in two years or three years, the, the pandemic somehow was halted. But eventually, the virus settled. And then from time to time, we'd, we would have uh, upsurges and definitely year in, year out, we have this kind of virus. So we have to live with that fact. So um that's that's the reality will we be having boosters on a regular basis or annual like annual flu shots would it as, be this in your opinion you th you think that that could happen honestly as i see it that will probably be the case and it's we're going to be a bit thankful if that will happen but simply because uh if our immune system is really working a lot at least we only get to have the mild form of illness yeah yeah and uh, honestly, uh, what I think is that it, each of us should understand that the things that we are doing right now um, should not be limited to COVID simply because in the next few months, in the next few days, probably the next few weeks or years, we may be encountering a different pathogen. And the lessons that we have learned uh, now can be applied. So always, we should always be on guard. 
uh, simply this is not to overact, but then leave with the reality that these things can happen. And if we are up to our toes doing things properly, appropriately, then there could be a reduction in the mortality associated with the newer pathogens. Because um, in the university, we have been taught that if there is a new pathogen or let's say a new virus, new bacteria that will go into the society, definitely there are no existing antibodies yet. And then then, then this can really cause um, bad kind of infection. This can cause a lot of morbidities to these individuals. So we have to be prepared. In the past, it has not been highlighted, but tuberculosis, even measles, are also scourges, which really have caused lots of uh, illnesses and deaths. But somehow with the improvement in the technology, improvement in the wearing of masks, the kind of masks that we wear, whether these are designed for droplets that we have or airborne, uh, airborne isolation pathogens, then we have come or we have gone a long way. I, I think I saw pictures way back in 1918 when they only used um, cloth masks, which of course, uh, currently nowadays, we don't uh, often uh, wear that cloth mask. Um, one more question um, before we close, uh, Dr. Rona. What about long COVID? You'd mentioned something about men being more susceptible to disease and severe forms of the disease, but there are some people that actually suffer way past you know the gestation period of 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 the of the virus right i mean they they go through the two weeks and you know they seem to be okay they don't seem to be um testing positive anymore but then they have all these lingering side effects that that some of them can be quite debilitating right over time yes we do get to have some patients who will have that unfortunately we cannot predict who among these individuals who would have COVID will really have that quote-unquote long-haul COVID. But we do get to have that. Now, as for the males, uh, probably the reason why is it that um, why is it that uh, they are more infected or probably more affected by the virus is the fact that um, the receptors are also seen in their, uh, in their reproductive organs. So males are more affected than, than females. Now, with regards to the long COVID as well, uh, there are certain measures that we have to, um, let's say, instruct the patient that if you continue to um, feel something like this, you have to have a regular follow-up. If there will be some need for further medications for those individuals whose lungs are really badly affected by the virus, then we do give this medications. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us, Dr. Rona. Thank you for that really, really informative, um, informative um, lecture. And um, hopefully, I guess it's here to stay, right? So yes, we, we have, just have we to have to accept that fact. <laughs> yeah, and stay and well, get boosted, get vaccinated, and and um, maintain hygiene and cleanliness standards, right? Yes. Uh, right. Thank you very much as well, Ms. Bambina. And thank you, uh, Manila House. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And for all of you who've joined us on Facebook Live, um, it was nice to see you. And please, um, if you want um, to watch a replay of this webinar, please go to our Manila House YouTube channel. Um, it'll be up in a day or so. So, um We'll see you next month. Our next webinar is, if I'm not mistaken, um, we have a webinar on March 15. It's more about voting because the elections are coming up. So we hope to see you then. We'll have more information soon. Thank you, Dr. Rona. Have a good evening, everybody. Okay, good evening. We'll see well. you again Thank soon. you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Doc. Thank you. Welcome. Um... Stop recording. Wait.